We're beginning a new series of Bible studies today through the book of 1 Thessalonians. A quick introduction to the letter before diving into its content. 1 Thessalonians is the first of two letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in the city of Thessalonica. It's believed that these letters are some of the earliest writings that we have from the Apostle Paul. Only the letter of Galatians is thought to be earlier. Scholars date the writing of 1 Thessalonians to have taken place in AD 51. 2 Thessalonians is then believed to have been written just a few months after that. Paul was in the city of Corinth, working, establishing the church in that city when he wrote the letters of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Now, I intended to have a map for you today. I didn't have time for that with all the other stuff going on here. Maybe I'll try to pull that together next week, or you can just Google Thessaloniki on your phone, and then you can see where the old city of Thessalonica used to be. Uh, the modern city is called Thessaloniki in Greece, uh, same place, and uh, that'll put you kind of in the geographical region of what we're talking about. Well, in the time of the New Testament and the Apostle Paul, the city of Thessalonica was an important seaport and trading hub with major routes running through it. So as a result, people from many different backgrounds passed through this city and made it their home. Thessalonica was the largest city of Macedonia and its capital at that time. The modern day city of Thessaloniki continues to be an important city in that region of the world. It's the second largest city in Greece today. It's still the capital of the region of Macedonia, and it's considered the cultural capital of Greece. Well, Acts chapter 17, the first 10 verses there, it tells the story of the starting of the church in Thessalonica. Paul and those with him had spent about two months in the city of Philippi, establishing the church there. And then leaving Luke behind at Philippi, Paul and Silas and possibly Timothy, they left and they continued their journey westward, deeper into the province of Macedonia, some hundred miles or so, eventually coming to the largest city of Macedonia and its capital, Thessalonica. There was a Jewish synagogue in that city. So following his usual practice, when he came to a new place, Paul went to the synagogue on the next three Sabbaths and preached about Jesus being the Christ. Acts 17.4 tells us that some of the Jews were persuaded, as well as a large number of Gentile men and women who were present. But a number of other Jews in the city were jealous of Paul's quickly growing influence. So they hired some thugs to form a mob and start a riot. Paul and Silas, they had to sneak out of the city under cover of darkness that evening. And then they continued down to Berea and then Athens and then finally to Corinth where Paul would remain for the next year and a half. Those three short weeks of preaching and turmoil formed the foundation of what became this beautiful, thriving church in Thessalonica. While Paul was at Corinth, he wrote the letters of First and Second Thessalonians uh, several months after arriving in Corinth. Timothy, he came down to Paul from Thessalonica, giving him an update on how the church was going, and that is what then prompted Paul to write the first letter to that church. Well, if you've got your Bible, let's flip over to 1 Thessalonians and we'll start getting into the actual letter itself. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in the first verse. It says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. This is the typical greeting found in letters of that time period. Rather than putting who the letter is to at the beginning of the letter like we do, dear John, and saying who the letter is from at the end of the letter, they put who the letter is from and then who the letter is to, and then they would include a blessing or a greeting. 
So he begins, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. This is who the letter is from. All three of these guys are known personally by the people in the church of Thessalonica. The simplicity of Paul's opening address here is suggests this close connection between them and this church. He doesn't identify himself as an apostle or say anything about where his call and his authority came from like he does in some of his other letters. They know each other. They're friends. He says, to the church of the Thessalonians, this is who the letter is to, the people in the church at Thessalonica. In God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, he writes. Paul manages to put two significant truths into this opening address of the letter. First, he points out that for the believer, a a new kind of relationship with God is created through Jesus Christ. God is now our Father, an intimate, loving, caring providing, protecting relationship has been created. Ephesians 2.13 says that we who were far away from God have been brought near. Through Jesus Christ, God has reached down into our world and scooped us up into His big, strong, safe, kind, loving, fatherly arms. The second thing that Paul does here is he refers to Jesus Christ with the title of Lord which is an acknowledgement of the deity of Jesus Christ. He says, grace and peace to you. The opening blessing is the usual one that Paul includes in his letters, grace and peace. This blessing, it's a combination of the standard Greek and standard Jewish blessing of the day. The usual Greek blessing was grace, and the usual Jewish blessing was peace or shalom. Paul, he takes these two standard blessings of the day and he combines them, making a new blessing conveying the idea that the gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation, is for all people, both Jew and non-Jew. Through Jesus Christ, God has made it possible for all of us, regardless of race, economic or social background, to have a relationship with him. We have all been given the same opportunity to know God through Jesus. No one is excluded. Everyone is invited. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor or Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul tucks this important truth right into the opening blessing of his letters. For believers... Grace is God's kindness and mercy and love freely given to us purely of His own choice and initiative rather than because we deserve it or we have earned it in some way. Peace. It's that inner wholeness and calm that comes from being in relationship with God. There there is now reconciliation with God through Jesus. Peace has been made. God's holy judgment has been appeased. Guilt has been removed where there was once hostility. There is now friendship. The offended God has become our loving Father. We've been adopted as His sons and daughters. And now peace is experienced in our deepest being. Verse 2. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul begins the letter telling the Thessalonians how he always thanks the Lord for them and continually prays for them. It gave Paul tremendous joy to see how these people have opened their hearts to the Lord, and they've received the gospel message with such enthusiasm and commitment. Seeing their changed lives, it blesses Paul deeply. God rescuing and redeeming and recreating people is one of the most amazing miracles there are. He takes our busted up train wreck of a life, and he makes something beautiful and useful out of it. Thank the Lord for saving us. Well, Paul, he mentions Three things which stand out to him about the changed lives of the Thessalonians. These same three things ought to stand out in the life of every 
follower of Jesus Christ. He says, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's linger for a moment on each of these three things. The first is work produced by faith. Notice the word order here. It's important. It does not say faith produced by work. It says work produced by faith. We receive salvation and come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ by faith. It comes through believing the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He died for our sins and He came back to life to give us this same new resurrection life of His. We trust in what He has done, recognizing that we could never earn it for ourselves. But real, genuine faith will produce good works. A life that is rescued and brought to life spiritually, it brings forth out of it blessing and goodness manifested through action. This is what Paul sees happening in the lives of the Thessalonian believers. It's what is seen in every person who has truly been born again by the Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. Works produced by faith happens. The second thing, labor prompted by love. The word labor and the word work, they're very similar words with very similar meaning. The word translated work is the general idea of working to accomplish something. The word translated labor <clears throat> It's a more vivid word conveying the idea of toiling, wrestling, expending great effort. The labor that we expend in doing good, which is an outgrowth of this new life that has sprung up in us, is prompted by love. It's motivated by love. Paul ties faith and love together in a similar way over in Galatians 5, 6 when he writes this. He says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision have any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Faith expressing itself through love. The Greek word translated expressing, it comes from the root word meaning work. Ergon. Faith working through love. Love. The word translated love here is the Greek word agape. Agape is the word that the first Christians began using to describe and distinguish the love of God from other kinds of love. God's love, agape, it, it, it doesn't recognize its object of love as being worthy and to be taken, as we often see exemplified in how the word love is used in our culture. You're beautiful. I love you. I want you. I can't be happy without you. That's not what God's love is like. Instead, agape love, God's love, is given not because one is worthy of that love, but because it is the nature of the one who loves. Agape creates worth in the one loved. And rather than wanting to take the one that's loved, agape gives for the sake of the one loved. God so loved, agape the world that He gave His one and only Son so that we would not perish but have eternal life. Well, when we become aware of God's selfless, giving, sacrificial, value-creating agape love, which has been given to us, it inspires and it motivates us to agape like Him. Agape prompts us to labor for the sake of others, as our Heavenly Father has labored for our sake. Third, Endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Endurance. What does that word mean? We see this same Greek word translated in our Bibles as endurance, perseverance, steadfastness, patience. It refers to not giving upness, 
not giving upness. In this particular case, it's not a passive enduring like a person resigning themselves to a life of suffering until it's over. I'm just hanging on until it's over with. That's not what endurance is. Instead, this is an active enduring like a determined athlete pushing through the pain of aching, cramping muscles, sweat stinging their eyes, pangs of hunger and thirst, burning lungs, struggling and fighting toward the goal, not giving up. That's endurance. And what is it that inspires such determined perseverance? Hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, it says. It's not enough to simply have hope to inspire our endurance. Hope must have a reason, a foundation that it's built on, an anchor that it's attached to. Hope is only as good as the thing we're hoping in. So when someone says, well, you just got to have hope, it means nothing. You have to have hope in something, and it needs to be in something that's substantial, that matters, that's going to really make a difference. And for the Christian, the reason for our hope, the foundation of our hope, the anchor of our hope is Jesus Christ. He is the one we are hoping in. Why does a follower of Jesus Christ continue believing that their soul is secure, that they have a future to look forward to beyond this life, that the good work that they are doing for the sake of others, that it all matters when they have had a bad day, a bad week, a bad month where they have made a shameful mess of their life and the lives of others. I mean, why would they think that they have any future at all worth living when that happens? Because their hope is not in their self. Their hope is in Jesus Christ. Their hope gives them the strength and the courage to keep going. See, if my hope is dependent on my life's scorecard, then I'm doomed. I keep going, even in the face of terrible, humiliating failure, because my hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in me and my performance. Verse 4, it says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that He has chosen you, Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. He calls them brothers and sisters. And it's easy for us to overlook something here that's really quite amazing for the times. Paul, who had been a highly educated, highly committed, highly respected Jewish man who would not have considered being in the company of pagan, defiled, immoral, disgusting Gentiles. It would have repulsed him beyond description to be in their company. He now refers to those people as his brothers and sisters. See, a profoundly deep, fundamental change took place in the man, Paul, when he came to faith in Jesus as the Christ. The Holy Spirit changed this man on the inside to such a degree that he now sees as his brothers and sisters people who he used to hate with deep prejudice. Get yourself some of that if you have not gotten it already. Amen? We all desperately need that kind of life-changing power creating in us the character of Jesus Christ. Paul says he knows the the Thessalonians are real born-again Christians, real followers of Jesus, real children of God, those who are truly loved by God and chosen by God because of the changed lives that he sees. Anders Nygren said, the gospel is not the presentation of an idea, but the operation of a power. 
the power of God changing the lives of people. When Paul came to Thessalonica and he told these people about Jesus being the Christ and what that meant for them, it penetrated their hearts and it changed them. These people, see, they they didn't simply hear and take hold of a new idea about how to see and interpret life. He, He didn't come into their midst and convince them that the world wasn't flat but spherical and that the earth wasn't the center of the universe but a planet revolving around its sun. He didn't come and give them nine steps for reaching their full potential. The words Paul spoke, they were in accompanied by the Holy Spirit opening the minds of the hearts of these people to see and to understand, convincing them of their need for salvation. Deep conviction. These people's lives were not changed by Paul's speaking skills. They were changed by God the Holy Spirit. Paul's three weeks of preaching in the city of Thessalonica, it should have ended in a humiliating defeat. A riotous mob drove him out of the city. But rather than that short visit being forgotten, a thriving church grew up from it. That was all the work of the Holy Spirit changing lives. Second part of verse 5. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. It says, in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. See, it was not easy to be a Christian in the city of Thessalonica in those days. That riotous mob that had driven Paul and Silas, out of the city, that same hatred, it was directed at the followers of this new king called Jesus. These people were looked at as unpatriotic, as traitors of their people. They were crossing cultural divides, calling people their brothers and sisters who they should have shunned as not our kind. They weren't showing allegiance to the gods and the kings of popular culture. They were being foolishly caring and generous toward people they were not obligated to. They believed God loved them and was genuinely interested in them. They were just weird. And they made others feel uncomfortable. This all gave others reason and justification to hate them, to persecute them, to bully them, to make fun of them, to mistreat them, to shut them out of society. But none of this stopped the Christians from believing in and following Jesus. They knew they had encountered the truth. They knew the changes that had taken place in their lives was real. There was no going back for them. Jesus Christ had given a new life that was worth more than all the world for them. See, that inner joy then given by the Holy Spirit, it strengthened them through this severe suffering that they were facing. And I'm sure, as is usually the case, that joy and their refusal to turn from Jesus, that caused their haters to just hate them all the more. Paul says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. I love the simplicity of this idea. We saw it expressed in the letter of Philippians 2. Rather than this complicated set of moral instructions to put into practice, we have this very simple concept that we can all remember and take hold of. Imitate Jesus. Imitate Jesus. And then we also see find imitators of Jesus and imitate them imitating Jesus. And finally, we're encouraged to live a life that can be imitated by others. This is what the Thessalonians are doing. Look at what Paul says in the next verses in verse 7. He says, And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. 
For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He says, you became a model. You became an example for others to imitate. Reports of the beautiful work of the, the Lord was doing in the lives of these people in the church at Thessalonica was spreading out not only throughout the province of Macedonia and Achaia, but throughout the whole Roman Empire. What a wonderful thing to be said about you. Let's pray that the similar thing can be said about us. The Lord's message rang out from you, he says. These people, they didn't simply live lives that imitated Jesus, but they shared the message about Jesus with others. See, there, there's a quote that has become increasingly popular in our day, which is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, although it's very uncertain whether he actually said this or not. But it goes like this, and you have probably heard this quote before, and maybe even shared it yourself. Peep, it says, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. Now that quote, it rightly points out the importance of living a life that imitates Jesus, that preaches the gospel in the way we are living. But it suggests that sharing about Jesus is optional, and that is not so right. See, we have the example of the people in the church at Thessalonica before us here who rightly did both. They lived out the gospel and they also shared it with others. It rang out from them. And this is the example that we are to follow. Finally, verse 10. And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So finally, we see the Thessalonian Christians Watching and waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Greek word translated waiting, it's an active, expectant waiting. They are looking for Jesus to come back. They are hoping for Jesus to come back. They are convinced that He is coming back. Paul is going to say more about this topic, this topic of the second coming of Jesus as we get further into the letter of 1 Thessalonians. But today... Uh, I want to say this. First, Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. It could be today. We want to always be ready. We notice that when great turmoil is taking place in our world, people start talking about the second coming of Christ and wondering if we are in those final days or not. Right now. We are in the middle of a global pandemic. Murder wasps, earthquakes, insect plagues, strange weather, economic turmoil, tensions between world powers, and this deep, bitter racial division that is tearing our nation apart in, in the very moments in which we speak. How can any of this ever be solved? Are we in the final days? We might be. We don't know. As followers of Jesus, we should imitate the believers in the church of Thessalonica who were always actively looking and waiting for the Lord's second coming. It says, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Final thoughts for us to take with us today. It gives me no pleasure to say this, but the Bible tells us that God's wrath will be poured out on this fallen, sinful world one day in a great act of judgment and cleansing to remove the wickedness and evil that has infected it. 2 Peter 3.10, for example, says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. 
That's the bad news. The good news is this. Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath. No one needs to go through the wrathful judgment of God. Jesus offers His hand of rescue to each of us. If you have not done so, I encourage you to do it even today in this moment. Turn from the things that you have been trusting in for meaning and purpose and wholeness and put your trust in Jesus Christ. Follow Him with your life and let Him change you, giving you a new life like He does for the believers in Thessalonica. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank You for this letter that Paul wrote to the church of the Thessalonians. We thank You for the good word that You've spoken to our hearts today. Lord, we pray that You would do in our life like You did in their life, that You would change us, that You would continue to change us, Lord, and You would make us more like Jesus. Thank You for bringing us to life in Him, giving us a future rescuing us. I ask God that you would fill your people with reassurance and joy today that you would lift their hearts and encourage them. And I pray for those today who have never taken hold of you before, Lord, that today would be the day that they do that, that they go, Lord, rescue me, save me. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.